Well, we're going to be looking at prayer again. I'm thankful that uh, I believe Tom Carnahan taught and and, uh, so grateful that he is willing to teach. He has the gift of teaching. But we're going to go a little bit deeper into prayer today. And um, we're going to um, begin to, we're going to look at the what is called the Lord's Prayer, but is actually a pattern prayer. But we're going to get into uh, some of the details on how to pray. And I've marked a few of these. We're not, we'll not have time to go through the entirety of them, but I've marked a few of these that I want to emphasize today on how to pray. Uh, I'd like to read a poem to start with, but let's open with prayer. Father, I thank you that you have made yourself available to us through the sacrifice of Jesus. And because of his blood, we're able to come into your holy presence. And we come to you in his name. We thank you for your work in our lives. We pray and we thank you that you are you have given us your words to reinforce and to strengthen us and encourage us, but also to prepare us. And we ask, oh God, that we'll not just hear words and gain knowledge and philosophically add to our repertoire of what we know, but what we hear today will be put into action and into use. We pray your blessing upon it for the glory of Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. So how to pray. I read this poem. In fact, my first pastor, his wife was a gatherer of poems, Mrs. Teasdale. And uh, isn't it amazing that even yet today, I was taught to call them Reverend, Pastor, and Mrs. Teasdale, not Ruth Teasdale. Uh, I was taught back then, you didn't call your teacher by her first name, right? You called them Mr. or Mrs. We've grown so casual today. And, um, but, but yeah, Mrs. Teasdale, I, that's still, here I am, 69, and I'm still calling her Mrs. Teasdale. The proper way for a man to pray, said Deacon Leno Keys, and the only proper attitude is down upon his knees. No, I should say the way to pray, said Reverend Dr. Wise, is standing straight with outstretched hands and wrapped upturned eyes. Could someone close that door for us? Thank you. Oh, no, 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 said Dr. Snow. Such posture is too proud. A man should pray with eyes fast closed and head contritely bowed. It seems to me his hands should be austerely clasped in front with both thumbs pointing toward the ground, said Reverend Dr. Blunt. Well, last year, I fell in Hopkins' well. Head first, said Cyrus Brown, with both my heels a-sticking up and my head a-pointing down. And I prayed a prayer right then and there, best prayer I ever prayed, the prayingest prayer I ever prayed, a-standing on my head. No, no, but... So there's no proper, no, no pattern as far as how we should pray given in the Bible other than Jesus prayed evidently in such a way that his followers, who were men that were accustomed to prayer, prayer very much a part of the Jewish tradition and Jewish um, worship of that day, when they heard and saw Jesus pray, it caused them to say, we don't even know how to pray. Because they said to him, teach us to pray. It's the only thing they asked him. That's the only request they ever made of Jesus. I think I've mentioned that before. They never asked him, teach us how to walk on water. They never asked him, teach us how to perform miracles. They never asked him, teach us how to open the eyes of the blind. The thing that astonished them the most was his prayer life. And think of that. They said, teach us how to pray. There was something about the way he prayed. So the Bible gives us hints and and gives us direction. It doesn't specifically say other than in one place, and we're going to look at that today. But we do know, as we covered before, a couple of these, that we are to pray in the name of Jesus. And John 14, 14 says, if you ask anything in my name. Now that's a wide open endorsement. That is incredible. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. But we are to pray in the name of Jesus. And we spoke about that a couple of weeks ago. And then we are to pray through the Spirit, through the Holy Spirit. We spoke about that as well. Remember, I wrote up on 
the board, uh, a Greek word that says him laying hold together with us through the Holy Spirit. And it says in Romans 8, 26, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Have you ever come to a place in prayer where you didn't know how to pray? You knew you needed to pray, but I just don't know what to say. I don't know the words. And the Spirit is able to help us. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. With groans that words cannot express. So we could spend a lot of time here, but in the name, through the Spirit. My father is also a wonderful Christian. I've just been so blessed with parents um, that serve the Lord. My father, as many of you know, was um, a pretty difficult, very difficult person. And um, when he came to Christ, he didn't have any knowledge of, of the Bible, of Christ. But at any, at any rate, God spoke to him very clearly one time, one night after he was saved, and, and told him he needed to begin witnessing to people and telling them about Jesus. So he did. And he was on fire. I don't have time to go into that. But my dad worked at the factory. Um, and in, um, it's not, it was called Quanex, but then it was called Standard Tube in Shelby, Ohio. And my dad spent almost every night. I have very early memories of my father when we lived on uh, 12th Street. Isn't that funny? Shelby has all little numbers, 10, 12, you know. We have great big numbers. I live on a little short street, and my number is 875. Well, there's not 875 houses on my street, but Shelby's a little more humble. They recognize that 12 4th, there was a little short street. And um, one of the earliest memories I have of my dad is him opening the side door by where the coal truck used to come and put coal down into the basement. And he threw, back then men wore hats. They dressed up. And dad, when dad went out to call on people or knock on doors, he dressed up. And um, he evidently was so, gone so much talking to people about Jesus that he would throw his hat in first into the kitchen. And I remember that, just teasing to see if mom was going to shoot it or not because he'd been gone so long. But my father talks the other day, he was talking about how God gave him such a burden for the lost in Shelby, Ohio, that at night sometimes all he could do was groan and he would weep and groan and, and cry out to the Lord for their salvation. And it's a long, long story, a miraculous story. But the Bible says the Holy Spirit, when we don't know what to say, the Holy Spirit knows what to say and will help us. That's how important prayer is. And then in Matthew, the sixth chapter, we all know this. In fact, let's see if we can say it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses debts as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. So we're, we're going to be looking at this. Many call that the Lord's Prayer, but in reality, in early, early Jewish writings, we see that the church used that as a pattern prayer. And it was incorporated in the church in the early days. They used that as a pattern upon which to, to personalize it and hang their own request. And when you walk through that pattern, they said that it took about an hour to complete it in prayer, which is interesting because Jesus said to his disciples when he was praying in the garden, could you not tarry one hour in prayer? So it is interesting that that, that hour keeps coming up uh, throughout the scripture. But let's, let's walk through this real quickly. There's a pattern here that we see. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It begins with praise, and it begins with a description of who we're praying to. It establishes who this prayer is going towards. 
remember that we are surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and that we are living not only in a natural physical realm, we're living in a spiritual realm. And there are a lot of prayers going up right now. Millions all over the, all over the world going up to Buddha, going up to different gods, going up even some of them praying to Satan. So what we establish in the very beginning is that we are praying to the holy God. Holy is your name. So it's an act of praise. We're praising him for his holiness, but we're also identifying and we're describing and distinguishing who we're praying to. Now, God is so great, as we've covered in earlier lessons, God is so great that one name will not encapsulate everything that describes who he is. We could never really describe um, who God is. I mean, we, he is indescribable, but he has made an effort to give us insight into insight into his character, into his person. Uh, one word that I forgot to put up here, one name for God is Adonai. And Adonai is from the, from the uh, Hebrew word Hava, or to be, uh, the I am that I am. The I am that I am. And it's used over 300 times. And it's interesting that it's plural. So it's a reference to Lord of Lords, plural and possessive. Now we're getting into a little bit of depth here, but it means my Lords, my Lords, and it's a reference to the Trinity. So even, even in his name, God is giving us insight into the fact that although the Lord is one, he is triune, he is one and yet three, indescribable, uh, impossible for us to understand. Maybe someday we'll have a deeper insight, but we must recognize that even when we cross over and uh, into that realm of eternity and our understanding will be incredibly um, expanded, you will be able to think like you've never thought. I mean, it's very, very, scientists know that we only use a small portion of our brain and some use less than others. <laughs> but, but, um, the, the fact is that man, hum, humanity was created with incredible mental ability. And uh, sin and, and the consequence of sin has not only shortened our lifespan, but it's shortened, it, it has lessened our abilities. And uh, so we will, but we will never under, fully understand God because that would make us like God. And God is finite or infinite and we are finite. So let's look at some of these as we praise, I'm going to do the board flip here. Today I thought we'd look at some of the names that God gives us. El Shaddai, there was a famous song and uh, that a, few, a couple decades ago now. Genesis 17 is El Shaddai. 17.1 is El Shaddai, and that, that means God Almighty the Almighty One. And then Jehovah, and it looks like Jireh to us, but it's Yireh, Yahweh Yireh, and we've spoken about that as well. This is the God. Interesting, this is dual meaning, and we saw this in Genesis 22 with Abraham when God told him to sacrifice Isaac. And that is the first mention of this name. And it is, is a reference to God with a God of pre-vision, God of pro-vision. So the God who not only provides, that's what that name means, and, and that's how Abraham used it, the Lord himself shall, the Lord shall, provide himself a sacrifice. The, so that's the God of provision, but also the God of prevision, which means the God who sees. He is the God who sees. Sometimes we wonder, does God really know? Does God really see? And Jesus emphasized, didn't he? 
He said, not, not a sparrow falls, but the Lord notices. I, know an, I heard of an evangelist that when he saw a bird uh, get hit by a car, like a, not on a freeway, but a two-lane road, he would stop and he would get out and stand by the bird as it was on the ground because he knew the Lord saw the bird get hit. And uh, I, there was an incredible a series of commercials, oh, probably 30 years ago, uh, talking about God and had witty insights, and they were interviewing God. In one of the commercials, they said, well, aren't, I said, well, thank you for all your time. And it was just a short commercial, but thank you for all your time, but I need to let you go because surely there's a lot more important things that you need to be doing. And in the interview, God says, oh, no, that's okay. He said, I'm everywhere. And he said, right now I'm helping a man out in Kansas change his tire. So God, God doesn't have to, to divide his attention. God, with prevision, has the unbelievable, infinite ability to focus all of his attention on you. See, we have to multitask. I noticed that the door was open when I was speaking, and I heard sound coming through, and, and Debbie, Mary went and closed it for me. Um, but that was, that was a division of my attention span, right? God doesn't have to do that. He can focus all of his attention on you and at the same time focus all of his attention on you. Explain that to me. Would someone please explain that to me? We can't do it. That's God. And so it's incredible. He said to Abraham, I think more thoughts towards you than the sand on the seashore. That's how many thoughts I think towards you. An incredible God, the God, uh, the Jehovah, Yahweh, Yireh, the God with prevision and the God with provision. So he sees what we need and he has what we need. And, and that's why Jesus said, don't worry. Your father didn't see Jesus expanded on this. He said, your heavenly father knows what you have need of. He knows he's Yahweh, Yireh. So then we go to Yahweh Rophe. We talked about that, didn't we, in the very first series of lessons on healing, the healer. And that is the God, Jesus, who heals. That's Exodus 15. The Lord who heals. Yahweh Nisi. Yahweh Nisi is Jehovah my banner. Um, so when the, the, the army of God is mighty, the Bible says, with banners, there's something stirring about a banner. Some of you, may, I don't know if you ladies feel the same way, but I don't know what is inside of me, but in battle scenes or in movies where I see them marching out with their colors and waving in the... There's something stirring about that. I don't know if God put that in us or what, but um, the, the Lord, our banner, and that, that is, the banner was a rally point. They would carry banners in. If you were in the thick of the battle and, and, and battles today and then, especially hand-to-hand -hand combat, was incredibly confusing. And if you didn't know where your fellow soldiers were, you watched for the banner. And okay, we're still here. And if there was a retreat called, the banner would go, you'd follow it. You would go back for hopefully an orderly retreat. Now, it, this refers to God, the Lord, as our banner and, to God's, and for God's people to rally to him. So he is mighty in battle, but also it was a sign of, of deliverance and that the battle belongs to the Lord. So he does not abandon us in battle. If we're going through battle, if we're going through spiritual battles, he is the Lord, our banner. And our banner now is the cross. He said, if I be lifted up like a banner, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. So there's that continuity of theme. The banner in the Old Testament in battle drew the soldiers together. And in the New Testament, Christ is our banner. He was lifted up so that he could draw all men to himself. Of course, that was a mystery back then. 
I mean, they didn't get that. We get that because we, we're on the other side of it. We can look back and say, well, why didn't they see that? You have to understand the cross was just a, a form of execution. It, it wasn't created for Jesus. It was used all the time. It would have been, I guess, to, uh, some, something akin to lethal injection or an electric chair. Can you imagine people walking around with little electric chairs around there on a chain on, on them? And that was absurd. That would be absurd today. People say, are you sick? What's wrong with you? Well, that was the early church. Their sign of their victory and of their God was a form of execution. It was a cross. And so think what a cult we would be called if we said our God died on an electric, in an electric chair. That's how absurd it was. But, but today we have, we think the cross and, I, and, we, and we praise God for the cross. But it, didn't mean this, it doesn't mean today the same thing it meant back then. We, we're looking through our eyes. And we say, why didn't they understand that? Well, that's why they didn't understand it. You go to, you go to someone, you know, in another state and, and Christianity is just beginning and you begin to preach to them about the electric chair. Isn't that graphic? You say, ah. Oh. Oh. And, and that's why Paul said the foolishness of the cross. It's foolish. It's absolutely ridiculous. But that was the method that God chose to bring salvation to the world. And we have the advantage again of 2,000 years of looking back and all of the writings. That was fresh to them. And so we can't be too hard on them. These, these people, I mean, I, I have a feeling you and I would have been, had the same struggles, right? And uh, we know the rest of the story. We have the advantage. And we say, well, Peter, look at the next verse, right? Peter says, I don't have the next verse. I'm living this real time. Guess what? You and I are still living this real time. And, and we're having the same difficulty, I don't know about you, but applying the faith to our everyday situation of what we're facing in life. So I, I got way off track. I've used up my time. This is what happens when I don't speak for a week. Listen. Yahawah Nisi. Yahawah M Kadesh. Which means the Lord who sanctifies. The Lord who sanctifies. The Lord who cleanses. Sanctifies. The word sanctify um, has dual meaning in the New Testament. We could talk about it sometime in the future. But the word sanctify is, is from root word that means to set apart. Something is sanctified, it's set apart. But it also means to cleanse, to purify. Um, I, I'm tempted to get, we'll go, we'll go into that deeper. Jehovah, Yahweh, Shalom. Anybody have an idea what that one means? Ah, very good. Judges 6.24, the Lord our peace. Yahweh Sidkenu, the Lord our righteousness. He is our righteousness. Jeremiah 23. Uh, 23. Yahawah Rohi or Rohi. The Lord my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. See, God was trying to give them insight in the Old Testament under the law as to who he really was. By all of these names, God was trying, the, the revelation of who God is is unfolding. As you read from the beginning into the book of Revelation, you see an unfolding, an, a turning almost like a, a, a dial on um, a dimmer, bringing men out of darkness slowly 
and revealing and revealing and revealing and revealing until the Word became flesh. And all of this came in one person, in Jesus. All of this came. The healer, the peace, all of these. Jesus said, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Somebody said it. The Father. This, this, this is what God was trying. And so we could almost say it like this. God tried to reveal who he was, who he was, who he was. And, but we know that Jesus, by the way, was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Jesus was not a second thought. Jesus wasn't like God in the corner saying, I'm going to try to figure out what to do now that man sinned. The Bible says that he had this planned all along. He was, the son was willing. But it's almost like God said, okay, yeah. I'm, just, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to go. And I'm just going to show them. And I'm going to live in front of them. And I'm going to demonstrate who I am. I've tried to tell them through names. Uh, I'm going to show them. Yahawah Shema, the Lord is there. He's there. God is omnipresent. The Lord is there. He's everywhere at once. It cracks me up when people think they can hide from God. Well, I'm going to turn the lights out and we're going to... And Seriously, the Bible says darkness is light unto him. He knows everything. He knows, he knows our thoughts. He knows what you're thinking about me right now. Oh, somebody just went, oh, careful. I say it very often. My wife will tell you, I'll say out loud because I'll be tempted to think something or to say something. <laughs> Lord, may the meditations of my heart in the words of my mouth be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. Okay. The Lord who is there. That's why it's important. It's not where I am. Oh, that's Exodus 48, 35. That's why it's important It's not where I am, there God is. It's where God is, there I'd better be. Because God is there. Where is there for me? Where is there for you? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Our steps are ordered by the Lord. Am I in alignment with God's steps? Where he wants me to be? Well, yeah. And we, we kind of think sometimes we can do our own thing. God's just going to follow us around like a little puppy dog on a leash. No. We, we'd better say, God, where are you going? I want to be there. In my life, where's the place of blessing? All right, we're going to cover one last thing in six minutes. And we can do this, but I want to reiterate it again. As we go from praise... To purpose. Let's close with purpose. This is holy is your name. This is your kingdom come, your will be done. We've talked about this numerous occasions. Um, that is, you know, that is actually in a command. It's in it's what's called it's what's called the imperative. It's in the imperative sense. Kingdom of it's meant to be said as a command. Kingdom of heaven come will of God be done. Let's talk about this for a moment again, just so that we can understand it and get it clearly in our head. In the pattern prayer, we're told, here we're told to pray for God's kingdom to come, his will to be done. If it's going to happen anyway, Doris Day, que sera, sera, whatever will be, will be. If it's going to happen anyway, why would God tell us to pray for his kingdom to come and his will be, to be done? Why would he tell us to waste our time? Because it's going to happen anyway. In another place, we're told to pray 
in, Ma- in Matthew 9.38, Jesus said, pray for laborers to be sent into the harvest for souls. If God is not willing that any should perish, and the Bible calls him the Lord of the harvest, why do I have to ask him and pray for laborers to go into the harvest field? Dutch Sheets said, so complete and final, because it goes back to the garden. It goes back to Adam, as we talked about. So complete and final was Adam's authority over the earth that God gave him. God gave Adam dominion. So, so complete was Adam's authority. So complete was humanity's authority that God gave to Adam that he, not just God, had the ability to give it away. Adam had the authority to give it away. That's how complete, that, that's the risk that God took. That has not ended. And we've already talked about the fact that when Jesus was tempted by the devil, and the devil said, I will give to you all of these that you're looking at. And he showed him the kingdoms of this world and the riches. Jesus didn't disagree with him. He didn't say that's a lie. That was true because Adam gave it to him. So Andrew Murray, who wrote a tremendous book on prayer, said God's giving, I know this is getting deep, but we'll close with this. God's giving is inseparably connected with our asking. Now, only by intercession can that power be brought from heaven, which will enable the church to conquer the world. Another place, it says, you have not because... If had, it's a must. So, if our world's in a royal mess... <laughs> who, did, who, did he give the, who did he give the power to to pray? Who's he waiting on? He's waiting on us. Waiting on us. And I would just say, not enough prayer... And and we could go into the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous person. Not the yawning, impassionate prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer. Your heart's in it. Will you pray through? And you pray through. That's it. Avails much. Avails much. So... We covered this in prior lessons, but God has limited himself concerning the affairs of earth and your family and you and this church and Salem and our nation. He's limited himself. He wants to. I think I told you that one night I just felt the strangest uh, sense. I didn't hear anything, but... Those of you that have heard God speak and impress to, upon you, and, and I've lost a lot of the liberals right now in this video by saying that I heard God. But <clears throat> I know that I heard God or the Lord say, right, interrupted my prayer. How dare he? Interrupted my prayer, and he said, I want to win this. What we were praying about, we were praying about our nation. We were praying about the battle that we're in. Pam and I were right in the midst of praying about that. And the Lord, it was like the Lord emphasized, you're on the right track. I do want to win this. You're not praying against me. I want to see America revived. I want to see our nation, your nation turn around. I want to see the lost saved and your children and grandchildren I want to win it. I want to win this. But he also, through that statement, very powerfully communicated to me, you've got to help me. I want to win this. What do you want? You going to join with me? And so that's this thing called prayer. It's, it's joining with God and joining in his purpose. Provision, give us this day our daily bread. That's not just physical That's spiritual. Jesus said, I have bread to eat that you know not of. Do you remember when the disciples came to him and he was sitting by the well and they said, Master, surely you're hungry. They've been talking to the woman by the well. 
And he said, I have bread to eat that you know not of. So this is not just a reference to physical need. This is a reference to every need. He's the God of provision. Protect, uh, pardon. For as we forgive those who trespass against us, he, he will forgive us. There's, there's forgiveness in this. Is there anything today, Lord, that I have done, thoughts that I have done, maybe maybe things that I don't even realize that have been displeasing to you and have offended your spirit? Forgive me. Bring that under the blood. And we have promise of pardon. We have promise of forgiveness. But it's contingent, isn't it? It's dependent. I'm going to be speaking about that in the next service. Protection. Deliver us from evil. The original, the evil one. Deliver us from the evil one. The plans of the devil. The devil has plans for you and I. The devil has a goal. And and, uh, we say, Lord, cancel them. You go before me. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. Not the will of the enemy. Not the will of people. I want your will in my life. Your protection. You guide me. You protect. And then we go back to praise. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory. A time of praise. And your prayers always include praise in your prayer life. Don't, don't just rush into the throne room with your wants. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme. Give praise, praise him and, and thank him for who he is. He's worthy. Amen. He's worthy of our praise far more than we can ever comprehend. 